Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number 39, Maha Asapura Sutta, the greater discourse at Asapura. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Angan country at a town of the Angans named Asapura. There the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, Venerable Sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this, Recluses, recluses, bhikkhus, that is how people perceive you. And when you are asked, What are you? You claim that you are recluses. Since that is what you are designated and what you claim to be, you should train thus. We will undertake and practice those things that make one a recluse, that make one a Brahmin, so that our designations may be true and our claims genuine, and so that the services of those whose robes, alms food, resting place, and medicinal requisites we use shall bring them great fruit and benefit and so that our going forth shall not be in vain, but fruitful and fertile. And what, bhikkhus, are the things that make one a recluse? That make one a Brahmin? Bhikkhus, one should train thus. We will be possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Now, bhikkhus, you may think thus. We are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Bhikkhus, I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Bhikkhus, you should train thus. Our bodily conduct shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained, and we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified bodily conduct. Now, bhikkhus, you may think thus. We are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing, and our bodily conduct has been purified. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Bhikkhus, I inform you. I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Bhikkhus, you should train thus. Our verbal conduct shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained and we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified verbal conduct. Now, bhikkhus, you may think thus, we are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Our bodily conduct has been purified, and our verbal conduct has been purified. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do, and you may rest content with that much. Because I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Because you should train thus. Our mental conduct shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained, and we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified mental conduct. Now, bhikkhus, you may think thus, 
we are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Our bodily conduct and verbal conduct have been purified, and our mental conduct has been purified. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Bhikkhus, I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Because you should train thus. Our lifestyle shall be purified, clear and open, flawless and restrained, and we will not laud ourselves and disparage others on account of that purified lifestyle. Now because you may think thus. We are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Our bodily conduct, verbal conduct, and mental conduct have been purified, and our lifestyle has been purified. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Bhikkhus I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Because you should train thus. We will guard the doors of our sense faculties. On seeing a form with the eye, we will not grasp at its signs and features, since if we left the eye faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the eye faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, we will not grasp at its signs and features, since, if we left the ear faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the ear faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the ear faculty. On smelling an odor with the nose, we will not grasp at its signs and features. Since, if we left the nose faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the nose faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the nose faculty. On tasting a flavor with the tongue, we will not grasp at its signs and features. Since if we left the tongue faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the tongue faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the tongue faculty. On touching a tangible with the body, we will not grasp at its signs and features. Since if we left the body faculty unguarded, Evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the body faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the body faculty. On cognizing a mind object with the mind, we will not grasp at its signs and features, since if we left the mind faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade us. We will practice the way of its restraint. We will guard the mind faculty. We will undertake the restraint of the mind faculty. Now, bhikkhus, you may think thus. We are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Our bodily conduct verbal conduct, mental conduct, and lifestyle have been purified, and we guard the doors of our sense faculties. 
that much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Bhikkhus, I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Bhikkhus, you should train thus. We will be moderate in eating, reflecting wisely. We will take food neither for amusement nor for intoxication, nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness, but only for the endurance and continuance of this body, for ending discomfort and for assisting the holy life, considering Thus I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings, and I shall be healthy and blameless and shall live in comfort. Now, bhikkhus, you may think thus. We are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Our bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct, and lifestyle have been purified. We guard the doors of our sense faculties and we are moderate in eating. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Because I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Because you should train thus. We will be devoted to wakefulness. During the day, while walking back and forth and sitting, we will purify our minds of obstructive states. In the first watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, we will purify our minds of obstructive states. In the middle watch of the night, we will lie down on the right side in the lion's pose with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware, after noting in our minds the time for rising. After rising, in the third watch of the night, while walking back and forth and sitting, we will purify our minds of obstructive states. Now, bhikkhus, you may think thus, we are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Our bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct, and lifestyle have been purified. We guard the doors of our sense faculties. We are moderate in eating and we are devoted to wakefulness. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Because I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Because you should train thus. We will be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. We will act in full awareness when going forward and returning. We will act in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away. We will act in full awareness when flexing and extending our limbs. We will act in full awareness when wearing our robes and carrying our outer robe and bowl. We will act in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting. We will act in full awareness when defecating and urinating. We will act in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking and keeping silent. Now bhikkhus, you may think thus, we are possessed of shame and fear of wrongdoing. Our bodily conduct, verbal conduct, mental conduct, and lifestyle have been purified. 
We guard the doors of our sense faculties. We are moderate in eating, we are devoted to wakefulness, and we are possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. That much is enough. That much has been done. The goal of recluseship has been reached. There is nothing more for us to do. And you may rest content with that much. Because, I inform you, I declare to you, you who seek the recluse's status, do not fall short of the goal of recluseship while there is more to be done. What more is to be done? Here, because a bhikkhu resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. On returning from his alms round, after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor. Percipient of light, mindful and fully aware. He purifies his mind from sloth and torpor. Abandoning restlessness and worry, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and worry. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt. Unperplexed about wholesome states, he purifies his mind from doubt. Because, suppose a man were to take a loan and undertake business and his business were to succeed, so that he could repay all the money of the old loan, and there would be remaining enough extra money to maintain a wife, then, on considering this, he would be glad and full of joy. Or suppose a man were afflicted, suffering and gravely ill, and his food would not agree with him, and his body had no strength, but later he would recover from the affliction and his food would agree with him, and his body would regain strength. Then on considering this he would be glad and full of joy. Or suppose a man were imprisoned in a prison house, but later he would be released from prison, safe and secure, with no loss to his property, then, on considering this, he would be glad and full of joy. So too, because when these five hindrances are unabandoned in himself, a bhikkhu sees them respectively as a debt, a disease, a prison house, slavery, and a road across a desert. But when these five hindrances have been abandoned in himself, he sees that as freedom from debt, healthiness, release from prison, freedom from slavery, and a land of safety. Having abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana which is accompanied by thinking and pondering, with joy and pleasure born of seclusion. He makes the joy and pleasure born of seclusion drench, steep, fill and pervade his body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the joy and pleasure born of seclusion. Just as a skilled bathman or a bathman's apprentice heaps bath powder in a metal basin, and sprinkling it gradually with water, 
kneads it until the moisture wets his ball of bath powder, soaks it, and pervades it inside and out. Yet the ball itself does not ooze. So too, a bhikkhu makes the joy and pleasure born of seclusion, drench, steep, fill, and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the joy and pleasure born of seclusion. Again, bhikkhus, with the stilling of thinking and pondering, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without thinking and pondering, with joy and pleasure born of collectedness of mind. He makes the joy and pleasure born of collectedness of mind, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the joy and pleasure born of collectedness of mind. Just as though there were a lake whose waters welled up from below, and it had no inflow from east, west, north or south, and would not be replenished from time to time by showers of rain, then the cool fountain of water welling up in the lake would make the cool water drench, steep, fill and pervade the lake, so that there would not be no part of the whole lake unpervaded by cool water. So too a bhikkhu makes the joy and pleasure born of collectedness of mind, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the joy and pleasure born of collectedness of mind. Again, because with the fading away as well of joy, a bhikkhu abides in equanimity, and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. He makes the pleasure divested of joy, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pleasure, divested of joy. Just as in a pond of blue or red or white lotuses, some lotuses that are born and grow in the water thrive immersed in the water without rising out of it, and cool water drenches, steeps, fills and pervades them to their tips and their roots, so that there is no part of all those lotuses unpervaded by cool water. So too a bhikkhu makes the pleasure divested of joy, drench, steep, fill and pervade this body, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pleasure divested of joy. Again, bhikkhus, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. He sits pervading this body with a pure bright mind, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pure bright mind just as though a man were sitting covered from the head down with a white cloth, so that there would be no part of his whole body unpervaded by the white cloth. So too a bhikkhu sits pervading this body with a pure bright mind, so that there is no part of his whole body unpervaded by the pure bright mind. When his collected mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three births, four births, 
five births, ten births, twenty births, thirty births, forty births, fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. He recalls, there I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives, just as a man might go from his own village to another village, and then back again to his own village. He might think, I went from my own village to that village, and there I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, spoke in such a way, kept silent in such a way, and from that village I went to that other village, and there I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, spoke in such a way, kept silent in such a way, and from that village I came back again to my own village. So, too, a bhikkhu recollects his manifold past lives. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. When his collected mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. He understands how beings pass on according to their actions thus. These were the beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, revilers of noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of noble ones, right in their views, giving effect to right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body, after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in the heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions, just as though there were two houses with doors and a man with good sight standing there between them, saw people entering the houses and coming out and passing to and fro so too with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human. A bhikkhu sees beings passing away and reappearing, and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. When his collected mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. He directs it to knowledge of the destruction of the contaminants. He understands as it actually is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. 
This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. These are the contaminants. This is the origin of the contaminants. This is the cessation of the contaminants. This is the way leading to the cessation of the contaminants. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the contaminant of sensual desire, from the contaminant of becoming, and from the contaminant of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Just as if there were a lake in a mountain recess, clear, limpid, and undisturbed, so that a man with good sight standing on the bank could see shells, gravel, and pebbles, and also shawls of fish swimming about and resting. He might think, there is this lake, clear, limpid, and undisturbed, and there are these shells, gravel, and pebbles, and also these shawls of fish swimming about and resting. So, too, a bhikkhu understands as it actually is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. These are the contaminants. This is the origin of the contaminants. This is the cessation of the contaminants. This is the way leading to the cessation of the contaminants. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Bhikkhus A bhikkhu such as this is called a recluse, a brahmin, one who has been washed, one who has attained to knowledge, a holy scholar, a noble, an arahant. And how is a bhikkhu a recluse? He has quieted down evil unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of becoming, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging and death. That is how a bhikkhu is a recluse. And how is a bhikkhu a brahmin? He has expelled evil unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of becoming, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging and death. That is how a bhikkhu is a brahmin. And how is a bhikkhu one who has been washed? He has washed off evil unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of becoming, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging and death. That is how a bhikkhu is one who has been washed. And how is a bhikkhu one who has attained to knowledge? He has known evil unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of becoming, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth. That is how a bhikkhu is one who has attained to knowledge. And how is a bhikkhu a holy scholar? The evil unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of becoming, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death, have streamed away from him. That is how a bhikkhu is a holy scholar. And how is a bhikkhu a noble one? Evil unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of becoming, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death, are far away from him. That is how a bhikkhu is a noble one. And how is a bhikkhu an arahant? 
evil unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of becoming, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging and death, are far away from him. That is how a bhikkhu is an arahant. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words.